Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Jubin Joseph. Um, Dr. Joseph is joining us virtually. Welcome. Uh, he's the Associate Director of Structural Interventions in the Cardiac and Vascular Institute and Clinical Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine at USC in Los Angeles. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome, uh, and we're interested to hear about the evoked tricuspid interventions. Great. Thank you for such a kind introduction. Very sad that I'm not there to be there in person because the program looks incredible. Um, and thank you for the uh, to the course directors for inviting me to give this talk. So we're going to talk um, on tricuspid valve therapies in general with a real focus on evoked um, valve replacement therapy. And just as a bit of background, we know that there's a lot of tricuspid valve disease. As cardiologists, we see it in our clinics frequently. Um, patients have lived with tricuspid valve disease and a very few number of these patients actually undergo any kind of surgical treatment for this. So in total, less than 1 point, less than 0.5% of patients undergo surgery for tricuspid regurgitation and the majority of these are repairs. The reason that patients don't undergo surgical treatment for tricuspid regurgitation is that although it is associated with significant morbidity and mortality, the in hospital mortality from tricuspid valve surgery is almost 9%. And we can see this data from earlier in the century um, that although tricuspid both replacement and repairs as isolated surgical procedures have slowly been increasing, the mortality accord associated with these procedures has stayed the same. And so as such, we then have a disease which is highly prevalent. We know there's a poor prognosis associated with it and we have very limited therapies to treat it. And that clearly defines that there is a significant unmet need to find novel therapies for these patients that might alter their prognosis or in, in, improve their quality of life. So before we talk about valve replacement therapies, I think it's really important just to recap some of the data that was presented at ACC and published in the New, New England Journal, and that was the triluminate pivotal clinical trial. So this was the edge-to-edge -edge repair for patients with tricuspid regurgitation with a clip device, which is very similar to the mitral clip device, but with a delivery system that has specific adaptations to make delivery into the tricuspid valve a lot more straightforward. Here, the investigators took patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation who were at greater risk for cardiac surgery and really kind of teased out patients from both a hemodynamic and anatomical point of view that they thought would result in a significant reduction in the tricuspid regurgitation. So these patients were well optimized. They had um, right heart catheterizations with low wedge pressures without prohibitive pulmonary hypertension and anatomy based on a transesophageal echo where it was thought a significant reduction in tricuspid regurgitation would be achieved. So they were not including patients with large cooptation defects, not including patients where pacemaker leads were severely restricting leaflet motion. And based on this, if there was a feeling that we could reduce tricuspid regurgitation to moderate or less, the patient was included into the randomized arm, and if not, they were in the single arm of the study. And at ACC, the randomized data was presented. And here we can see that with edge-to-edge -edge repair, we can, call, we can create a significant reduction in tricuspid regurgitation. And in all comers, at 30 days, we were getting moderate or less TR in 87% of patients. When we look at a paired analysis going through to the one-year primary endpoint, we're getting reduction in, um, to moderate or less TR in almost 90% of patients. And it's important just when we come on to talking about valve replacement therapy, 50% of those patients were trace or mild and the other 40% were moderate. So as a result of that reduction in tricuspid regurgitation, the study actually met its primary endpoint, which was a hierarchical composite endpoint looking at these um, clinical endpoints, including death, tricuspid valve surgery, heart failure, hospitalization, um, and KCCQ. And as you can see here, the reason why it achieved its primary endpoint was a real marked improvement in KCCQ in patients who had undergone um, edge-to-edge -edge repair. 
when we look at that in a little bit more detail, we can see that the difference in the improvement in KCCQ is related to both the residual amount of tri tricuspid regurgitation left. So patients with moderate or less tricuspid regurgitation had much greater improvements in their KCCQ quality of life score than patients who were left with more significant tricuspid regurgitation. And furthermore, when you looked at these paired analyses to see what the difference in a patient's K um, TR grade was, those that achieved the greatest amount of TR reduction resulted in the greatest improvement in their quality of life. So that's important when we now start looking at valve replacement technologies, because valve replacement technologies come with larger devices and, some, and nearly all have obligatory anticoagulation, but have the promise of having a greater reduction in tricuspid regurgitation reduction and also possibly a greater durability of the, the effect of that. So here's just some images of some of the tricuspid valves that have been implanted in humans. And you should have all heard about the intrepid valve, which Dr. Zar was talking about in the mitral space, but there's definitely some experience of that in the tricuspid space. And what we're going to talk mostly about is with the Edwards evoke system, which you can see here. Now, this is a picture on the left of the Edwards evoke valve and an animation on the right. And it's a really beautifully designed valve. It has these flexible atraumatic anchors, which um, are deployed and capture the leaflets on the outside within the ventricular portion. And then it has a conformable outer frame, which is covered in fabric. And then the bioprosthetic valve leaflets are on, are on the inner frame. It comes in a variety of sizes, 44, 48, and 52 millimeters. And they all are delivered via a 28 French delivery system. And here you can see on this animation on the right, you result in this beautiful um, valve that's implanted at the level of the tricuspid annulus. So we establish wire access with a safari wire into the RV apex. We bring the valve into the right ventricle. We align it so it's coaxial with the valve. We release those anchors and then carefully under echo guidance capture the leaflets and we slowly expand the valve and bring it up to the annular plane. And then once it's in a stable position and we look like we've captured the leaflets, we release the valve in its atrial portion. And using this, it can anchor both at the leaflets, at the annulus, and through its interactions with the subvalvular apparatus, typically the cords and the papillary muscles. In terms of what this looks like on a cath lab table, you, similar to other mitral devices that you may be used to. You have a plate which sits under the patient. You have a, um, a base which goes over the patient's leg and then over this base and plate a drape is placed. On top of that, a stabilizer is affixed to the base and then you have the valve delivery system which comes with controls which affect its, the amount of flexes that you give which allow you to correctly orientate it to the native anatomy. And so let's just quickly go through an example patient and an example procedure. So here we have a 74 year old lady. She's got worsening peripheral edema and shortness of breath. These are patients that we typically see. She's got a history of atrial fibrillation. She's had a previous pacemaker inserted and had a previous TIA. She had two hospital admissions in the year prior to um, us seeing her. And after diuresis, she still had significant tricuspid regurgitation, as you can see on this transesophageal echo. As such, she was referred for transcatheter therapies, and we considered her for enrollment into the EFS study of Trison. Part of the workup for that is a CT scan, which is cardiac gated, to look at both annular sizing, RV dimensions, and in her case, the path, work, the path and adherence of her pacemaker leads at various settings. So here you can see that she has an RV annular dimension in diastole around 47. And this was well within what we thought um, we could treat with the tricuspid valve replacement with the evoke device. Um, so here is just some fluoroscopic and echo pictures 
which really can highlight the points that you saw in the animation. So based on our CT analysis, we thought that we wanted to place the valve septally to the right ventricular lead that was transversing the tricuspid annulus. So to do this, we really used 3D um, echocardiography, looking down onto the tricuspid valve, and you can see the trajectory of the um, right ventricular lead, and you can also see the trajectory of our safari wire, which is on the septal side. We confirm that with fluoroscopic views, and we mostly work in this long axis view of the ventricle, which is typically around RAO30, where you can see the right ventricular apex and imagine where the tricuspid annular plane would be in a coplanar view. And really, this procedure is guided heavily by um, transesophageal echo. And the use of multiplanar reconstruction is critical to try and correctly orientate and position the valve at all stages of deployment. So once we have established wire access into the right ventricular apex, we will introduce this 28 French uh, valve delivery system. And as we're introducing it into the right atrium, we begin, to, we, begin, we begin to place this flex, which you can see, which horizontalizes the distal part of the um, valve delivery system. And this is what we call primary flex. That allows the valve to be orientated in the anterior and posterior position. So here you can see the valve is quite central. Here's anterior. Here is posterior, and you can see that the pacing lead that is pre-existing is tucked away into that posterior um, portion. And here again, you can look at the tricuspid valve, and here you can see the septal leaflet and the non-septal leaflet here, which is the anterior leaflet in this case. And you can see the valve delivery system nice and coaxial with the annular plane. And again, you can see the pacing leaflet, the pacing lead on the lateral side. So this transesophageal echo really gives you all the information you need to know in order to get your valve delivery system coaxial with the valve and to ensure the depth of your valve is at the appropriate point. So once you've got this into the right ventricle, you slowly re um, retract your catheter. And I hope you can see that with my marker, you, you create a little gap between this nose cone and the catheter tip. And that gap you can identify on the transesophageal echo, and that's what's known as the capsule gap. And at this point, you want that cap, you want your catheter and valve delivery system to be central and coaxial with the valve, and that capsule gap to be above the papillary muscles and below the um, leaflets. And here we'd, we ran into just a little bit of difficulty with the nose code because it was slightly, was not in the apex because it was caught in some trabeculations. So we then took a transgastric view, and you could see that the nose cone was caught in some trabeculations, which prevented it being in the true RV apex. And just under echo guidance, we just did some minor manipulations with um, clocking the, the um, rotating the delivery system and also retracting the nose cone a little to try and free us up, and we got into the nice RV apex. These things are rarely prohibitive problems that just take a little bit of thought and careful guidance from imaging to get into the right place. And then once we're happy that the capsule gap is in the right place, we take a brief procedural timeout because at that point in time, if we can't align the valve properly with, with regards to tra trajectories or we can't get adequate depth with regards to the capsule gap, we can remove the device from the patient uh, without any consequence. As soon as the anchors start being deployed, it becomes a little bit more difficult to remove the valve because we can't recapture this device. So here you can see on the right-hand side the very first step of valve deployment, which is releasing your anchors to 90 degrees. And again, we're doing that under echo and fluoroscopic guidance to ensure that we don't entangle ourselves into the papillary muscles and we don't we're not so high that we start pinning um, tricuspid leaflets with the anchor tips. And once we're at 90 degrees, we will sequentially deploy those anchors so that they point towards the atria. 
And you can see here that the anchor tips are now pointing atrially. And we've also expanded the ventricular portion of the valve. And as we do that, we look carefully at the leaflets to ensure that all of these leaflets in the short axis are going over the anchor top, uh, are going over the anchors such that the leaflets are not pinned behind the anchors and are traveling between the anchors and the body of the valve. And when those are when all nine of those anchors are on the outside of the leaflets and the leaflets are coming in nicely to the body of the valve, we expand the ventricular portion and then slowly reduce the depth of the implant, either by pushing on the RV wire or by retracting um, the capsule with the controls on the handle to bring the anchors close to the annular plane. And then once the anchors are close to the annular plane and we feel that the valve is coaxial to the, um, to the tricuspid annulus, we can release this valve. And releasing here is very stable. We just gently um, pull back these sheets and the preloaded valve kind of stays exactly where we want it to be. We don't rapid pace for this and it's typically quite an un unremarkable part of the procedure. Once the valve is deployed, um, we assess it with echocardiography and then we withdraw the nose cone into the capsule and slowly withdraw the valve delivery system. And then we check it with transesophageal echo. And here you can see on the left hand side, our valve appears very stable. The leaflets are opening nicely. There's no tricuspid regurgitation that we can see at all. Um, the lead is in that posterior septal commissure, which is what we'd hope to. And you can have a nice 3D looking onto the valve, which shows that there's no paravalvular leak and, in fact, no intravalvular leak. There was a mean gradient of one millimeter of mercury after this valve implantation. So that was just an example of a procedure. So typically, these patients are elderly, they're comorbid, they often have atrial fibrillation. About a third of the patients have pacemakers, so it's important to be able to um, deal with the leads. Um, and here is the data from the early feasibility part of the study, which was presented at London Valve um, in November. And in the early feasibility study with patients with growth and tricuspid regurgitation who were anatomically suitable for um, valve replacement when the evoke system were recruited and we looked at both 30 day and one year outcomes. In terms of the patients, the, the average age was about 70 nine years and the majority of were female. They were at elevated surgical risk and this was calculated for mitral valve replacement. 92% of patients had atrial fibrillation. More than half had some form of renal disease, although we excluded patients that were on dialysis. And a third, more, around a third of patients had had previous valve intervention and around a third of patients had some form of either pacemaker or ICD. In terms of procedural results, we had device success in almost 95% of patients and procedures at that time were taking slightly longer than an hour. Patients typically did stayed in hospital for a few days and were discharged home. The majority of the pathology was secondary and this really was likely due to atrial dilation in the setting of at um, atrial fibrillation. In terms of the clinical outcomes both at 30 days and one year, in Remembering that this is an elderly and often comorbid population, there was a one-year mortality of 9.4%. There were vascular access complications in under 3% and unplanned dialysis in around 3% as well. The major risk or the major adverse event that was seen in these patients were bleeding complications that were not related to the access site. And this is maybe reflective of the elderly population that were anticoagulated either because of atrial fibrillation, but certainly following valve implantation and there were bleeding events in the year that followed. About 13% of patients in this cohort had a new pacemaker placed and the majority of these had pre-existing conduction disease, typically with the left bundle at baseline. In terms of 
the kind of Kaplan Meyer curves, you can see here that three to a year, we're getting 90% survival rate and about 88% freedom from heart failure hospitalization, which again is similar to the numbers that were seen in the triluminate study and reassuring from a point of view of valve intervention. Now, the real remarkable thing about the evoke tricuspid valve replacement is both this effect and durability on tricuspid regurgitation. So here you can see uh, all comers um, at both at 30 days and one year, um, patients who had torrential massive and severe tricuspid regurgitation at baseline were now getting either none or mild in 98% of patients, both at 30 days, and that is maintained three to one year. And here you can see in paired analysis that we have a significant reduction in tricuspid regurgitation at, by discharge, and this effect is generally maintained three to one year to really remarkable um, durability of a result. In addition to the reduction in TR, we can see some physiological benefits to, um, in these patients. We've got reduction in RV size, suggesting right ventricular remodeling. We've got reduction in IVC diameter, suggesting better volume management. And we've got improvements in both stroke volume and cardiac output. And there is no significant um, increase in your tricuspid valve mean gradient at one year. So these were all very reassuring findings, both with reduction of tricuspid regurgitation but an improvement in RV function and cardiac alpha. So when we look at the more clinical um, endpoints, we can see that in this single arm study, there was a significant improvement in NYHA class and a very high improvement in um, KCCQ score with a delta of approaching 26 points that was associated with an improvement in six minute walk test. So the TRISEND study, which is the early feasibility study, um, really showed us that we could achieve favorable survival and heart failure hospitalization rates with tricuspid valve replacement with the evoke device. We had significant and sustained reduction in tricuspid regurgitation, and we also had evidence of right heart remodeling with improvements in cardiac output. There were significant improvements in both NYHA class, KCC key score, and the six minute walk test, and the randomized pivotal study, randomizing patients to device versus medical therapy is underway. So we'll just take a moment to look at that one year data of the early feasibility study of Tricent together with the pivotal data from the edge to edge repair. And you can see very similar rates in heart failure hospitalization three to one year. And although these are slightly different in that Tricent is reporting survival alone, whereas Triluminate was survival and freedom from tricuspid valve surgery, the tricuspid valve surgery number here is very small. And you can see generally similar um, one year outcomes in these patient cohorts, which may give us an idea as to what we will see in the pivotal study. Importantly, let's also look at quality of life because as we have these tricuspid regurgitation patients, we have them for a long time in the clinic and although they've got bad quality of life and limiting symptoms, they don't tend to die from cardiovascular causes. Um, but here we can see the triluminate study resulted in a 12 point improvement in KCCQ score, whereas the Tricent study resulted in a much larger improvement, albeit in this single arm study. Um, and we know that from triluminate, the degree of improvement in quality of life seemed to be related to the degree of reduction in tricuspid regurgitation, which is why maybe with the valve replacement study, we're seeing a much greater improvement in quality of life score. So let's briefly just talk about the pivotal study on valve replacement. So here patients are no longer qualifying if they have moderate, they need to have severe tricuspid regurgitation. There are other significant um, exclusion factors that 
you just need to be aware of. So you can't take patients with other significant bowel disease, patients with severe pulmonary hypertension, so that's an invasive systolic pulmonary artery pressure of greater than 70, or significantly elevated pulmonary vascular resistance of greater than five Woods units are all excluded. And also patients with severe RV dysfunction are excluded from the study. Based on their CT and their TE and their clinical status, the patients who are approved into the study are randomized in a two-to-one fashion to either receive the device or medical therapy alone. And medical therapy alone for this cohort really consists of, an, of um, diuretic therapy alone. Endpoints are going to be followed through to one year, looking at both safety endpoints with adverse events, efficacy and um, both with regards to reduction in TR and clinical endpoints. Um, we've talked about the significant exclusion criteria, but really it is any patient who has severe tricuspid regurgitation with an annulus, which is of the optimal size for valve replacement that doesn't have severe pulmonary hypertension or severe RV dysfunction. So that's the study and that's currently enrolling and that's enrolling very well. And I just thought I'd talk to you a bit more about a couple of different examples to see um, how other patients do and kind of some issues that you might come up to. So here's an 84 year old lady with severe functional tricuspid regurgitation. You can see on the echo pictures and the CT that her right atrium is grossly enlarged. She had um, a left bundle branch block and she's got a few comorbidities that put her at higher risk of surgery. Based on her CT, we thought she would be good for a 44 millimeter evoke valve and we placed that with exactly as we wanted to, as you can see on the echo below, and there was no significant um, tricuspid regurgitation following valve placement. However, you can see on the echo below that the patient developed significant bradycardia and indeed developed complete heart block. Now, this was quite early on in our experience with conduction abnormalities following um, evoke placement. So we kind of took a belt and braces approach and placed pacing leads both from our jugular access, we placed one in the CS lead and from our femoral access, we placed one in the RV apex. Um, and that just kind of stabilized the situation temporarily while we thought about how best to um, put in a pacemaker. Obviously with a freshly implanted tricuspid valve, bioprostatic tricuspid valve with the idea of reducing tricuspid regurgitation, we didn't want to leave a lead across the valve so under TE guidance, we can quite simply just place a leadless pacemaker into the RV apex. And the reason we do this under TE guidance is that whilst this valve is quite freshly implanted, we don't want the uh, pacemaker delivery sheath to try and either dislodge or put undue pressure on the valve or the valve leaflets. And here we just placed a micro um, through that freshly placed tricuspid valve replacement and that went out without issue. The patient was discharged on day two and then came back their 30 day follow up and again had no significant TR. And you can see on that CT had a really nice stable appearance, both of the valve and of the leadless pacemaker. So given that there are a third of patients that we're treating have pre-existing leads, I think there's um, just a couple of things to be aware of and CT is really useful in planning for this. We look at the position number of leads, where they cross the annulus, how much slack there is and how adherent they are to subvalvular structures. Um, the CT is really useful because we can then just have a look to see where the tip of the lead is. Does it, is it adhered to the pap muscles? Is it adhered to the leaflets? And here we can see this leads probably adhere to the papillary muscles, but it's probably free of the leaflets. And then we confirm that with mm. pre-procedural transesophageal echo to ensure that the leaflets are not adhered to the lead, which would kind of make valve um, positioning and leaflet capture more tricky. We then look at the CT and project how the valve delivery system will be and how the leads will sit and make a plan and here you can see we want to be anterior to the lead we want to be this is the septal portion we want to be lateral to the lead and 
we should be able to be fine with the lead in the post receptor commissure. So here is just just part of the importance of using TE to guide you. So our first kind of placement of our steerable sheath, which we typically use as the agilis catheter, was on the septal side of this lead. So here you just have to unflex, clockwise rotate, and then reflex to get down onto the lateral side of that lead. We then placed the safari into the RV apex and then deployed this valve pretty much without any significant problem. And you can see how that lead is just in that pastry receptacle commissure without any issue. And then this, we just did the CT of 30 days to kind of see how all of this anatomy sits together. And you can see that this lead was functioning well and was nicely mobile despite the valve being in position and it wasn't causing any tricuspid regurgitation. Now, very rarely the lead is in a position where we think that we would like to manipulate or change the trajectory of the lead. And here you can see we've got a um, active RV lead, which is screwed up into the right ventricular outflow track. And it was completely transversing across the tricuspid annulus. So once we'd established wire access into the RV apex, we thought we'd be better off if we didn't, if we could manipulate the lead. So just taking a rim catheter from a jugular vein, we kind of scooped under the the lead and pushed it up into the anterior receptor comp and kind of held it there whilst we did valve deployment. And we then just deployed a valve in a pretty straightforward fashion whilst pinning this lead into the anterior receptor comp. So it didn't cause any tricuspid regurgitation or any problems as we were deploying our valve. So I think I'll stop there. I mean, clearly there's a great amount of excitement with tricuspid valve therapies. Um, we are learning which patients benefit the most, and we've got some nice clinical data to demonstrate that at least from quality of life indices, we can make significant improvements in patients' lives by reducing the level of tricuspid regurgitation. Tricuspid valve replacement over edge-to-edge -edge repair offers a likely greater reduction in that level of tricuspid regurgitation, and hopefully that tr translates to a greater improvement in quality of life. It's uncertain if by, redu by reducing tr tricuspid regurgitation, if we will affect heart failure hospitalizations or indeed mortal cardiovascular mortality, but we'll see what TRICEN2 shows us when that, when that data is ready. Interestingly, we have some these patients are often comorbid and often quite frail, and there are bleeding events there. With this valve, it is recommended to have anticoagulation. In EFS, it was re recommended to have warfarin anticoagulation, and, but it is down to the investigator's discretion as to what anticoagulation to use. And so we'll see if that bleeding, that possible increase in bleeding that we saw in Trisend 1, um, how that is borne out in the randomized study and to see if that is in, puts patients at increased risk and to see if the net clinical benefit is there with improvements in quality of life. So that I will end there and open up to any questions that there are. Thank you. Do you have any questions before I introduce the next one? For yeah. Dr. Joseph, go ahead. Are we, the, uh, are we on the panel? Or? No, no, no. I was going to ask if anybody has any questions. Dr. Joseph, first of all, I want to thank you on behalf of everybody um, for an excellent talk. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I, I have a few comments. Go ahead, If, if I may. Hi, please. Jubin. Um, for, Hi, those, for, for those of you uh, who might think we look the same and talk the same, <laughs> and uh, those of you astute enough to look at our CVs might have noticed that since 2002, we've been at the exact same place at the same time. Despite knowing Jubin for 21 years, I asked Newell and George to invite him to give this talk <laughs> because... Um, so Jubin, how many evokes and tricuspid have you implanted? So yeah, we, um, I mean, started off very high, but finished at, at about 71. Um, 71, and, but, and, and the next- Yeah, but, but that was- And I, how many of the next highest implanters implanted? 
Oh, I don't like to keep score. But, yeah, um, so probably yeah. around 20. So Jubin's implanted <laughs> three or four times as many of Oaks and Tricuspid as anyone else. So I think a, a, a great person to just give us real uh, tips and tricks and, and, you know, talk about the challenges, especially about, about these, this valve implantation. Yeah, great. No, certainly. And like in that part, we've learned so much over the last two years in terms of this valve implantation, all the way from sizing. When we started doing this, we really didn't know what level of annular oversizing we needed, how it interacted with the path muscles or the cords. And so I think the, the procedure that we're doing now and the planning we're doing now is really much, much improved from where we were at the early start stages of EFS. And to that point, when you looked in EFS, they were kind of average uh, implanting device times of around 71 minutes, that's really now down to well below half an hour. So you're looking between 20 to 30 minutes to get this in in the majority of procedures. So I, I would, you know, as a surgeon, I'd like to um, comment a little bit and get your thoughts as well. Um, you know, because we've talked about a lot of therapies uh, evolving over the last uh, 15 years and uh, we, we, we spoke a lot about aortic valve evolution to the point that um, we're moving into treatment of moderate AS, expanding uh, horizons, improving outcomes with both surgical and transcatheter valves. Um, the mitral space is, is interesting because uh, the surgeons would like to think, and I think there's, a, there's evidence supporting the fact that a, a, a good mitral valve repair is hard to repeat, uh, but we're, we're involved in ongoing trials to test that theory against uh, clip therapy as well as uh, transcatheter mitral valves. So the tricuspid valve, which is the uh, so-called forgotten valve, um, is, is anathema to the cardiac surgeon. And I think that, uh, you know, in terms of, of what we can do in the operating room, by the time we see patients with significant TR is, uh, is quite daunting. The outcomes for tricuspid valve uh, repair and replacement in the setting of even mild right ventricular dysfunction are, are, are not overwhelming. So. Uh, just, uh, you know, for anyone, yourself included, the, uh, I mean, the, the concept of, 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 of a viable tricuspid therapy is, is, I think, a very important step forward. And, uh, you know, having watched this evolution myself, I mean, these, these are the early, uh, again, you know, we're thinking these are the early years, if you will, of tricuspid therapy. What are your thoughts about the future? Uh, for tricuspid valve replacement? So, yeah, no, that's a great question and a great point in that obviously these patients often present quite late into whatever disease process they have with their heart being corrected left-sided disease or long-standing atrial fibrillation or even some patients with some degree of pulmonary hypertension and almost by that very nature they tend to be at elevated a risk for conventional cardiac surgery. I think part of the part of the attraction of these transcatheter tricuspid procedures is that the procedural risk is incredibly low. We are essentially doing a transvenous, single transvenous access, um, and we're doing these procedures with, like, not, you're not even doing a transeptal puncture, which. Um, would add to the risk and we can do these procedures now quickly. Often these patients are staying one or two nights in hospital afterwards and going home. And so the procedural risk in these sick comorbid hearts is very low with tricuspid, with transcatheter therapy. So I think if reducing TR it does ultimately um, result in clinical benefit, this will be the way to show it. Jubin, I, I had a question about the procedural challenges with regard to imaging in particular. How often do you find the TE imaging to be slightly inadequate and how often have you used ICE to supplement that? With all of these things, it's, I mean, your imager will grow in experience 
as your procedures grow with um, grow in number. And definitely, as we've done more and more procedures, the imaging's got better and better. But secondly, as the MPR technology has improved over the last couple of years, that's made it the procedural guidance a lot better. Now, between the tra um, kind of esophageal and transgastric imaging, we can do that in the majority of cases. And the reason why imaging becomes difficulty, difficult with this is when you're looking at the anchors and to see if the leaflet is between the anchor and the valve frame. And typically, I'd say in probably 95% of patients, you can do it with transesophageal echo alone. There's a, a small sub portion where you, you end up either using transthoracic or even ice to uh, kind of confirm leaflet capture. You know, it's, it's encouraging to, to hear your procedure times, uh, and that, that's a nice goal for us. I, I have to be honest, you know, we, we've done six or seven um, evoke, and, I, and we aren't at the point yet where it's that quick. I mean, it, 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 I'd say it's taken us a good, you know, 90 minutes, uh, you know, I think to get yeah. the valve in. So it's, it, it's been a bit tedious, We're, but we'll, we'll look forward to, uh, to getting, you know, quicker. And, and the, the imaging has, has been the biggest challenge. It's been, you know, being unable to be certain whether we have leaflet or don't. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's, that's encouraging. But George, yeah. don't you think we spend about 20 minutes getting there and about an hour and a half thinking about letting it go? Yes. Yeah, but it, yes, I do. I, I think, but I think that's get, being confident that we're ready to let it go. You, you know, so yeah. So you're speaking to the imaging aspect of it. So yeah. what do you think about that, Omar? So Omar. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is comfort level. I mean, there are, of course, redundancies built built into the valve. You can miss a couple anchors. They can't be next to each other, et cetera. Um, so it doesn't have to be perfect for the valve to anchor. And on the right side, there, there's much less risk of embolizations and all that stuff because it's a low pressure system. But I think it, the greatest part of it is just comfort level, as Jubin said. So he's done 70, so I'm sure his team is, is very comfortable with what's going to happen. Yeah. And, uh, our team is not We're not there yet. Not there, not yet. there yet. So I wonder if you could talk to um, so you know you put forward some predictions for trisend and triluminate. You know, two of the things that come to my mind about a valve replacement and tricuspid is first the pacemaker rate, and then the second thing is some of these valves and even evoked to an extent has radial force outwards on the on the RV. Whereas edge-to-edge mm -hmm. -edge repair pulls in the annulus, uh, and it would just seem that that would be m more beneficial in terms of RV remodeling and prognosis. Um, how long have you followed your patients up for? Um, have you noticed a difference in RV function with, with the two therapies? Yeah, so I think in EFS where we took some patients with severe RV dysfunction, there were a very small number of patients that didn't respond, that RVs struggled with um, valve implantation, and none to the point where we needed to do any additional mechanical support, but there were some patients that took that left the cath lab on a small dose or of typically the butamine, and was there for two or three days for the RV to kind of um, accommodate to the changes in its afterload. And those patients have done okay afterwards. There's still probably about 20% of patients that we are treating that don't feel like a big clinical benefit. But I would say the majority, well over half of patients, do feel a lot better um, after this. With regards to the RV remodeling, it was good to see in the one-year data from EFS that there was reduction in RV dimensions and improvements in cardiac output and stroke volume. There was, however, a reduction in TAPSI, and I think that is to your point that this occupies a large part of the RV base and may, may impair basal function. So in the, in the 
pivotal study, patients with severe RV dysfunction are not being included into the randomized cohort. So I think those patients probably will be better off without ha with maintaining that basal function and not having a large valve in place. Um, so I think, and with regards to comparing it to edge to edge repair, I think what we're going to find out over the next few years is is the significant reduction in TR which you get with valve replacement because I mean it's rem the reduction in TR was rem remarkable from um, Tricend 1 which is what you'd expect with valve replacement is that improvement in, tri in TR reduction worth the payoff that you take for having a larger valve at the, at the RV base and also requiring anticoagulation. So what about the, uh, you know, the anticoagulation issues? How, can you comment on, on wh how that, you know, we as surgeons, we, we depend heavily on, on uh, anticoagulation for uh, longevity of the valves. Um, so can you comment on anticoagulation strategies? Yeah. So um, firstly, we are excluding patients that can't safely tolerate anticoagulation. So just um, so that there are patients who who have a bleeding a bleeding um, comorbidity. That means you can't safely anticoagulate them, so they're not even getting into the study. When we started in EFS, we were pretty much putting patients on warfarin with an INR goal of between 2.5 to 3.5 plus a single antiplatelet therapy for six months, but then long-term anticoagulation. That over the course of EFS kind of slowly reduced to anticoagulation as a single agent based on um, implant or investigator discretion. And I think it is a significant question and it's a significant concern. Interest, we, as you saw in EFS, there was a large number of bleeding events um, almost around 30%. It's going to be interesting to see in the pivotal randomized study what the bleeding event is in the control arm because these patients are often, we have 90% plus with atrial fibrillation, so they're often anticoagulated anyway. They um, are comorbid and they've got often, they've got renal dysfunction, so they're at greater bleeding risk. So I think we'll see if the bleeding is attributable to the mandatory anticoagulation from the valve replacement or whether or not it's just part of this sick comorbid population that are on anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation. It's very interesting. Any other questions? No, well, uh... Jeevan, thank you very much for your time and uh, for showing us your garden in L.A. <laughs> so I hope it's sunny in New York, and I hope you guys have a great evening. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.